Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope none of you are surprised that I'm talking to you in English. I hope we were transparent enough about that. Tomorrow uh, the discussion will be in German with a simultaneous translation, but I'm glad to welcome here uh, not only all of you, but especially our guests from I have not really finished counting, but it must be at least 15 different uh, EU member states that are represented today in, in, or tomorrow in this room. So very much welcome here uh, at the House of the European Union in Austria during the Austrian presidency of the EU Council. Um, actually, this format that we call civil society in dialogue has already some kind of tra tradition. This is the third year in a row. Uh, we used to have it in a different location, uh, not far from here, at uh, a place called Urania, uh, where um, the room gives us the opportunity to put the podium really in the middle of the room so that we can have re a real dialogue. I think um, when uh, a format, an event format is called dialogue, then it's usually not acceptable to have this kind of um, polarized setting with some, usually we call them experts in the front of the room and the others that are not so experts uh, filling the rest of the room. So our idea is that we are all experts um, in, in one way or the other. And um, as I said, unfortunately, we had to make a compromise here because technically this would have been just yeah, nearly impossible. Uh, to put the podium in, in the middle of the room. So that's why you find us, or you will find us still sitting here in front. But, and this is in, a uh, this is in mayuscule, big letters, uh, but there will be a fifth empty chair. So we will try to stick to the format that we used to have uh, during the last two years, meaning that there will be um, three uh, panelists on the podium with a moderation and there will be an empty chair. And the first half of the discussion will, should not last more than 90 minutes, one and a half hours. The first half of the discussion will be reserved for the panelists to say what they want to tell us. Um, and the second half will be for you. So I already now invite you and encourage you to make uh, use of this possibility whatever comes up during the first half of the discussion, to step up, take a seat, say what you want, and leave again, please, to give space to the others. So this is a kind of um, adventure, this is a kind of risk. Maybe you turn out to be too afraid to step up and say something, then we will just have the experts continuing discussing for another 45 minutes or all of you want to step up and say something, well, then we will have to handle that. So this is on uh, just a few words on, on, on the setting. Um, well, speaking about rules already, I have to make my usual GDPR statement here. Um, we are not going to share the list, uh, the names, uh, your, your personal data, the list of participants with anyone else. This just remains with with ego, but as you can see, there are pictures being taken, so please, if you do not want to appear on these pictures that may be used on our website, then please tell Claudia, my colleague, and she will uh, carefully avoid to uh, you being on the picture, okay? Um, yeah, I think I should at least make a, sh uh, a short introduction for, uh, of, of ego, or IGO, or IGO, I don't know in English yet. In German, we, call, we prefer to call it EGO. Um, uh, sometimes, maybe you, so those of you that have seen Stranger in Paradise know this ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. So sometimes I'm playing with this idea of saying, I go, you go, we all go for I go. <laughs> yeah, that would be very nice if we all would go for I go. Um, that is unfortunately not yet the case. Uh, we make a rather bold claim by calling ourselves the voice of the public benefit organizations in Austria. Um, well, we have some 50, or a little 
a little bit over 50 members, important members, smaller ones, bigger ones, from all different parts of um, civil society. Uh, but many are not members of, uh, of EGO. So that's why we have created, uh, two years ago, we have started to build a new alliance uh, of only platform organizations called Bündnis für Gemeinnützigkeit in German. Uh, it will sound familiar for those that come from Germany because we didn't make a big effort in creating a new name. We just copied what they have in Germany already. They call it Bündnis für Gemeinnützigkeit also. Our Bündnis is much larger as theirs. Um, and that, all together in that Bündnis, we have, we were not able to count yet, m certainly more than 1,000 civil society organizations represented, covering really the whole range of activities. Um, and that's what I'm proud of and what gives me hope um, that even facing quite some challenges nowadays in Austria, in all those countries where you come from, in the European Union, looking at the European elections in May next year. With all those challenges, there is some reason for hope. And I see this reason also in you being here, in working together with us, supporting what we do. Um, and that's actually what is my expectation also and my hope uh, that is going to happen over um, uh, during this afternoon and tomorrow morning um, that we will leave this room really inspired and positive and optimistic about what we will be able to do in order to not only save this European project but to make it a really project a real project of European citizens. So that much for, <laughs> for an introduction on, 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 IG, uh, on, on EGO. Um, those of you that uh, come from, from Austria, um, uh, certainly, or I hope, that they will have read, um, noticed that there was quite um, um, uh, uh, an information was taken up recently, uh, since Monday actually, uh, published by Civicus, I don't know if everyone is familiar with Civicus, uh, a worldwide alliance for citizen participation based in Johannesburg. And they have been running for the last two years uh, something they call the Civicus Monitor, where in, in a very uh, scientific and evidence-based way, they rate, uh, I think, almost all countries in the world according to the civic space in these countries. And uh, so far, Austria has been rated open. And since Monday, we know that it has been downgraded to narrowed, which is still far from being closed, which would be the worst case. Uh, but still, this has been taken up quite by some media here in Austria um, and uh, has created some attention, which honestly, I have tried also to channel somehow here to this event. Everybody knows that an event as such is not so much of interest for the media, um, but still I have some hope that maybe tomorrow with uh, at least one member of the Austrian government being present here, we may still have an opportunity to talk to one or the other journalist also about what is the concern of, of our event here. Yeah. Um, I've learned it's good to start with the end in mind. Uh, well, talking about the end in mind, I hope that by tomorrow afternoon, we will have an idea of uh, what a positive, a constructive future of uh, Europe, the European Union could look like. There's a lot of talking about framing and narrative these days, okay, as long as we don't have better uh, words to uh, to call uh, to to um, yeah to, to express what we mean. I hope that this can be the start of the building of a new positive narrative for uh, Europe and for the role of civil society in Europe. And uh, once more, the fact that you are here, that uh, representatives, that people 
men and women from s so many different member states are here. That gives me some hope um, that uh, this could really be the beginning of uh, the building of such a positive narrative. That much as an introduction from my side. Um, there is another tradition um, which goes beyond Austria um, and th that tradition consists in uh, trying to follow the, um, the EU presidencies in each country from one country to the other and for that reason I was in Sofia in May when they had uh, the EU presidency. I might be in Sibiu next year uh, in Romania when they take on the, over the, the presidency of the, uh, of the council. And that's why I'm very happy to have here both representatives from Bulgaria and from Romania. And since this is the tradition, I'd like to call it also in a way of the handing over of a stafette of, um, of an alternative agenda that we try to build and to implement over the years. I've heard this is already the 10th year, or it has been uh, su uh, successful, uh, successfully done over 10 years. Um, I'm glad to invite Eva Taraleshkova at that point from Sofia, uh, from the Bulgarian Citizen Participation Forum, to uh, say a few words about the situation in Bulgaria as regards civil society and what she wants, uh, let's say, to deliver as a message to, to us during the Austrian presidency. Please, Eva. Thank you very much, um, Franz, for inviting me here. Thank you very much, Alexandrina, as well. Uh, it was a very difficult November, but uh, I could not say no to this uh, event. Um, I'm not uh, very much used to making opening speeches. I'm more in the practical uh, topics, but uh, I, that's why I've prepared, and I will uh, allow myself to read from time to time. It doesn't happen often. So, uh, my name is Iva Taraleshkova, as you very, very correctly read. And um, I'm the board, the, a board of the, the, uh, the board of directors uh, president of a big network of Bulgarian non-governmental organizations called Citizen Participation Forum. We have about 120 members from very different uh, uh, spheres of uh, social and political uh, life, but they are all united by the idea of uh, uh, being more present and participating more actively in the decision-making processes at the different levels, like municipal level, regional level, national and international level. So we try, what we try to do is really give more voice to uh, common statements and opinions, uh, make uh, common recommendations towards uh, improving the legal environment, the political environment, and also the public uh, envir environment for uh, participation of uh, civil society organizations. So, I will start my speech with that. Dear colleagues, dear partners, dear friends, uh, I would like to call your friends because uh, I know a part of you in this hall and maybe by the end of this day we'll, I can make more friends, what I hope to do. So uh, the century that we live in is a really uh, a, a dynamic one. It has a lot of uh, social and political dynamics that we have not observed so far in our work. Uh, we have a strong terrorist wave affecting many uh, different countries in a different way. We have unprecedented online communication development, which together with the positive uh, sides of it, uh, leads sometimes to overwhelming circulation of fake information and rise of hate speech sometimes. We have massive migration processes that do really uh, cause political and economic crisis in our 
countries. And these are just some of the processes resulting in negative and anti-democratic political and public attitudes, distorted debates and uh, in the social platform and in the social platforms and in the pol public speech. The situation in Bulgaria is not different from the situation in the other countries. And uh, recently we made some brief assessment of, uh, of uh, the environment that we work in and we came to the following major conclusions. Between 2013 and 2018, Bulgarian civil society organizations became the major victim of smear campaigns with a growing number of negative publications and insulting qualifications. In parallel, some politicians and big corporate businesses use hate speech to counteract citizen activists who work against corrupted and non-transparent decisions defending private or narrow political interests. A whole new jargon or Deris of deris derisive words has been coined to address human rights defenders and civil society organizations in general, distort their messages and obscure the necessity of, for, of standing up for democratic values. Maybe this is the situation you witness in your countries as well. These all seriously weaken the public support for civil society organizations and democratic reforms and they do lead to a growing mistrust in civil society organizations' causes and actions. And this is a problem for us, a growing problem for us. A crucial co consequence is the limitation to the effectiveness of the civil society actions, leading again to non-transparent, non-democratic decision-making and lack of public control on government. However, we found out that there are certain positive developments, let's say, uh, or, or achievements for the civil society organizations to step on, to use in our further, in planning our further steps. A few, but still some, positive changes in the legal environment regarding civil society organizations, registration and operation happened in Bulgaria in the recent two years. Some steps, some steps, towards improved public consultations have already also been done under the pressure of civil society organizations and networks. There are some good stories told in media and some examples of well-targeted information campaigns. It's difficult, but still there are really some stars that shine. And another very good achievement, I think, and very important one regarding also related to our meeting here, is that existing networks and coalitions increasingly utilize their potential for improving civil society organizations' effectiveness and performance. We have united in Bulgaria, several networks and coalitions to make a bigger coalition to really combat these smear campaigns and negative tendencies in the environment for NGOs. So, what, what, what we decided to do and what we could uh, discuss on as well as, as from our side, from the side of Bulgarian civil society organizations, but also as a continuation of this dialogue we have been leading for several years now with Europe-wide, are the following. Joining efforts at national, micro-regional, and EU level, I think is crucial for, for really having some uh, success in this, let's say, battle. Saying micro-regional, I would emphasize on the micro-regional strategies. We are just back from a meeting in Brussels with uh, Miklos Barabas, with whom we met in DG Radio uh, to talk about fostering more better communication within these micro-regional strategies towards fostering citizen participation and 
since we are in Austria, and Austria is also a part of the Danube strategy, but also other micro-regional strategies would be a good model to do that. Uh, challenges should make us stronger and smarter. So we see already the need for consolidation and sharing of expertise and experience in tackling these problems. And that's why I think that such events are extremely important for, for that. Improvement of cooperation at all kind of level and uh, joining efforts and uh, resources, I would say, to resist the smear campaign is of common understanding. That is why I think joint strategies and campaigns are seen to be the most adequate response to the, to the negative campaigns and the tendencies in the public perception of civil society organizations. Another point is, or another direction in which we should work is changing, I will also word this word, Franz, changing the narrative, because I couldn't think of a better one, in our countries and in Europe. We have to work for improving the public, uh, the public image of the civil society organizations and the understanding about their role in the democratic process in nowadays. To respond to the smear campaigns in media common communication strategies have to be developed, I think. Uniting all different networks and coalitions, because one individual organization cannot, cannot do it. Uh, and I think that uh, these, um, these campaigns should uh, contain comprehensive messages for the broad auditoria to understand about the role and the results of civil society organizations' actions. And I also think that it should contain positive stories uh, to, tell, to tell the audience like proactively, but also mechanisms to respond to negative campaigns reactively somehow. So the strategies should also plan campaigns to foster citizen involvement and maybe civil education, civic education, which is in some countries really lagging behind. For example, in Bulgaria. Strengthening the individual civil societies will also improve their performance, their resu the results of their work and their public outreach. What, what we mean is that small and medium-sized funding should provide for capacity building and sharing of expertise among civil society organizations from different sector, sectors and scope of work. Uh, and we have to really defend what we have been talking about for, for several years, uh, different small funds allocation locally, meaning in the municipalities, nationally, at the level of micro regions and also at the EU level for such always to have small accessible funding which is easy to operate by smaller civil society organizations in order really to improve their performance and outreach, for, for example. Uh, I think that the European Values Instrument is a mm, very good step forward. Let's see what will happen to it uh, to boost the weakened resilience of European democracies. As I said, micro-regional strategies could also be a possible uh, way, road to, to support that. And to finish, I will just uh, quote uh, a writing that exists on a, uh, on a memorial in, um, in the United States. It's a memorial of the free freedom of media. And it says, freedom is not free. We have to think about that because democracy is not for granted. And I think that we need to, to work for it every day, to, to water it so that it is there, and uh, to make it constant, constantly and inevitably be there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eva. Now I make a step from Vienna to Bulgaria to Brussels or Paris, I don't know. P Paris? 
the two, <laughs> les deux. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Jean-Marc Croiron, uh, whom I happened to know a couple of years ago when uh, he was introduced to me in, in here in Vienna by Gerhard Bisowski from Volkshochschulen. And since then we have been in regular contact and uh, Igor has become a member. We have a good meal. We have a good meal. A good meal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we had a good meal in Brussels together, yes. Well, we usually we don't mention that here. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, since then Igor has joined uh, the um, European Civic Forum. Uh, who, uh, with whom we are organizing this event together. So I'm glad to have you here, Jean-Marc, today in your um, multiple uh, roles as a, if I don't, I'm not mistaken, you, are, you have still a, a role in La Ligue de l'Enseignement in, in the board in Paris, and he is the president of European Civic Forum and also the president or the chairman of Civil Society Europe and he's a member of the European Economic and Social um, Committee. Yeah, please, Jean-Marc, your introduction. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a real pleasure to be with you in Vienna these two days for our joint conference. Thank you, France, and the whole team, the huge team, for the great work. Precisely 10 years ago in La Rochelle, the most beautiful town in France, we put on good track the process of NGO forums during the EU presidencies. It is for us an opportunity, an opportunity to connect European with local civil societies and institutions and to narrow the gap between these two levels of action and engagement. With the European Civic Forum, we travel a lot around Europe and meet up with civic actors to understand the environment in which we operate, the challenges we face, and the struggles that unite us, especially in the difficulty time we are living. In today's Europe, civil society organizations are key actors in respond responding to the societal and political crisis marked by rising inequalities, fears, and social insecurity on the one hand, and the growing affirmation of reactionary discourses and political forces on the other. The last few decades of liberal economic policies have slowly but surely produced fear in our societies, linked to a lot of frustrations, fear of being left behind, left outside, left alone in case of an accident in life, in case of economic crisis. The mainstream traditional parties that dominated political life in Western Europe, just as the parties that embarked on a neoliberal transition in Central and Eastern Europe, are now rejected because they are fully associated by citizens with policies of social and societal insecurity. This rejection of dominant parties is often captured on the electoral field by reactionary nationalist forces whose answer to social fears is the rejection of the foreigner, the newcomer, the different. These voices tell us that in order to ensure access 
to fundamental rights for the many, the solution will be to deny them to some. In our part of associative sector, you can say NGOs and voluntary sector, our action is driven by the values of equality, solidarity, inclusiveness. Because we carry these values, our civic space is attacked, narrowed down by repressive legislation or put under stress by financial restrictions and what you describe, France, in the, when we met about the situation in Austria is very illustrative of emergent trends around Europe. We are worried that more and more governments, including so-called liberal governments, are questioning the role of civic organizations. Just as trade unions or business unions, they are legitimate stakeholders and interlocutors representative, representing millions of people in Europe. Civil society organizations create strong social bonds and sometimes complement public policies, especially when the states cannot longer ensure basic social services. Even more worrying is the model of society which lies behind these attacks based on tribal divisions between different groups in society, leading to the war of all against all. But everywhere in Europe, civil resistance is organized to curb the initiatives of the most reactionary governments and sometimes even to stop them. While there is a specificity in each national situation, there are a lot of similarities from one country to another. This is why we must build part of our answers together at all geographical levels and across all sectors. For us, civic participation and civil dialogue are crucial indicators of the state of health of all democracies. In a time when the European Union has been going through a deep crisis of democratic legitimacy of its decisions, just as national party politics, we need to imagine and see new ways of functioning of democratic institutions in order to better connect politics with realities on the ground and meet people's needs and expectations. To achieve a more democratic and socially fair society, in a time where the politics of division gains traction all across Europe, civil society shall be the barricade against the temptation of division. The mega campaign, Make Europe Great for All, initiated by the European Civic Forum and its member, will provide an open and democratic space to think collectively upon these challenges and reclaim a democratic, just, and inclusive way out of this deadlock, uh, Europe, Europe, where social and environmental justice and sustainability prevail over economic interests. To conclude, I am convinced that citizen do not want authoritarian regimes that reduce freedom. They want a democracy that works for all, that ensures no one is left behind and all can live 
a decent life. Civic organizations are decisively contributing to this in very everyday work. Our biggest challenge is now to be more vocal and to make our messages more visible. This is why we have decided to organize for the first time ever a pan-European Action Day for Civil Society. On 10 December 2018, we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. On this occasion, we want to remind our civil society is contributing in its daily work and struggles to put these fundamental rights and values at the core of our societies. We want to show unity and build transnational solidarity among civic organizations and actors. Reclaim the right for civil society to take part in the public deba debate and policy making. Defend and support human rights defenders who face increasing pressures. This attack attract media and public attention to the role of civic actors in keeping societies democratic, just, and inclusive. Dear friends, I wish us a fruitful debate which will contribute to strengthen our work together for the values we share, as no society can be called democratic if civic organizations and movements are kept at safe distance from the public sphere, denied participation and the right to articulate and express dissent. Thanks very much. And now we come back. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Now I would like to, in, uh, in, to invite, without uh, much further ado, um, our colleague um, Alexandrina from the, she is the Gen General Secretary of European Civic Forum and she will be the moderator of the first panel discussion to step up and invite her guests to the panel. Thank you. France for having us here. Uh, I think that already in the, uh, in the opening we had a very good introduction into the topics we are going to discuss now in the panel. Um, <clears throat> indeed, today, uh, as civil society organizations, uh, we are very much worried about this crisis of democracy we are witnesses, witnessing at, uh, at all levels. Uh, from our point of view, we are worried about, of course, how democracy works and uh, how citizens individually or collectively uh, are given the possibility to have a say on democratic processes, but also uh, we are very much worried about uh, what democracy delivers uh, in terms of social justice, access to rights for all, inclusiveness, tolerance, etc. So we consider there's a huge gap between the promise and the performance in democracy and the discussion today uh, I think it will be an opportunity to, to dig a little bit deeper into the root causes of this. <clears throat> then uh, we are also very much worried about the, the collapse of the consensus, uh, the democratic consensus uh, which has been built in Europe uh, after the Second World War, uh, having this uh, universality of human rights uh, and values at the core. Uh, and this, has, this is uh, translated uh, in, uh, in a various number of, uh, of ways and it has been already illustrated by the speakers in the opening. Um, 
And then, of course, uh, we are wondering very much uh, on what kind of drivers, both institutional and uh, civil society, we can rely upon to uh, rebuild solidarity, to rebuild trust in democracy, trust in the capacities of our institutions, and also in our own capacity as civil society to hold societies together. So uh, the panel today uh, we call uh, All for Rights and Rights for All, which is also uh, the name uh, uh, or the slogan of our uh, action day, uh, No Day Without Us, we are planning for 10 December, uh, will be an opportunity to, to discuss uh, all these topics. And we are very uh, happy to have uh, great panelists here today. Uh, I will start by introducing uh, Veronika Mora, who comes from Hungary. She's uh, the director of uh, Okutash Foundation, an environmental uh, foundation. She's working in Hungary, but also uh, she's very much involved in cross-border activities at European level, even global level. And, uh, and she, she became one of the frontline uh, resistant uh, to, to the current uh, attacks and uh, attempts of the Hungarian government to dismantle democratic states and uh, civil liberties and the rule of law. Um, ne uh, we have also with us uh, Valtrud Helle from uh, the FRA, the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. She's dealing with uh, relations with civil society uh, and she will share with us some interesting findings of a recent report by the FRA on the state of civil society in Europe. And we have Vedran Jihic from uh, the Austrian Institute of uh, International Affairs. And he's also um, a lecturer at the University of Vienna, works very much on um, analyzing uh, democracy, uh, international relations, but also uh, civil society, and also uh, the relation between the crisis of democracy uh, between the East and the East and the rise of illiberal uh, authoritarian forms of governments uh, in the Southeast Europe. So let's start uh, with uh, Veronica Mora. Uh, we will have uh, around fi 15 minutes uh, for each, uh, each initial uh, contribution. I will try to organize them uh, on different questions. And then we will open up uh, for a discussion with the audience, with the empty chair. So please, uh, by the time we will approach the end of the conversation, please feel free to take the empty chair because it will not be a sort of question and answer with the audience. You just feel free to sit here and then I will introduce you to the debate. So let's start with Veronica. Uh, as a first uh, entry point into the discussion, uh, I think it would be very interesting to start with uh, how uh, civil society was uh, built also and contributed in Hungary to the uh, democratization agenda and to the introduction of the whole human rights uh, agenda and discussions after the fall of communism after 89. Uh, how this process, very briefly, of course, you could <laughs> speak, I, I think, for hours and for days about it, but very briefly, uh, maybe by giving us some elements, this can explain also the situation in, in which civil society is uh, today and um, maybe can explain the fragility but also the resilience of civil society in Hungary. Okay, thank you very much. And I also thank the organizers to, for inviting me to this event. I haven't participated uh, before. And I will try to keep the long story short, but you are very right, Alexandrina, that we should maybe tr uh, start with the transition from socialism to um, democracy around 8990. Uh, and in Hungary, this process was characterized by being a top-down managed uh, transition. Of course, there has been democratic uh, underground opposition. Uh, there has been some movements uh, that organized protests, um, not least around environmental issues such as the Danube, Plan Danube Dam uh, during the mid-80s and the second half of 80s uh, in Budapest. Still, uh, the transition process in Hungary basically followed the Soviet perestroika, Gorbachev's perestroika model and was managed um, centrally without uh, a very strong civic movement uh, as a driving force. So 
Looking back, I'd say that this created a situation where Hungarians generally did not really have to fight for freedom and democracy. They received it ready-made, uh, so they did not have to really suffer for it. To the contrary, in the early 90s, in the eco following economic restructuring, uh, many people found uh, themselves suddenly the so-called losers of the transition, losing their jobs, their livelihood, their security. So they, they, they didn't experience freedom necessarily as, as a liberating positive force, but rather a new uh, problematic negative uh, situation in their own lives. And as I said, while some civic movements played a role, uh, the, Hungar the roots of Hungarian civil society go back much longer to the mid-19th uh, century, but of course uh, they suffered a long break, a uh, 40-year break under the socialist period. So civic organizing basically started or restarted uh, at the time of the transition in the early 90s. Uh, some of the underground uh, oppositional movements came into the light as uh, new civil society organizations once freedom of association was uh, granted by the new legislation. But also actually uh, those uh, state-sanctioned organizations that existed legally under the socialist rule have also somehow su uh, survived and transformed them to themselves into more or less uh, civil society organizations. But then the vast majority was brand new and came up uh, without really any um, prior, um, anything prior. In the early 90s, US mostly private donors coming from America uh, played a very important role uh, in developing civil society in Hungary. They appeared very early on in the very early 90s and brought not only money, which was also a factor, so brought not only money, but also concepts, strategies, philosophies, uh, the concept of civil society as such, and uh, with that, tools, methods, um, how, to, how to organize and how to uh, move forward. Um, at the same time, in the 90s, um, the whole democratic institutional system and legislation had to be built up from scratch, and many of the organizations focused on this. So they focused on what the state, what the legislator, legislators are doing, and how the democratic structure uh, was created and built up. This has changed a bit uh, around the time Hungary joined the EU in, in 2004. Uh, the Americans felt that their mission of building democracy was complete, so they started exiting the region, uh, not only Hungary, but Central Europe in general. Um, but the European Union, or at, or at least funding from the European Union, didn't really have any specific aim of supporting civil society de development as such, or didn't have really strategies about civil society, but rather t treated civil society organizations as, let's say, subcontractors or service providers uh, who could perform um, or receive grants to perform some very specific pre-described tasks. Um, and this led to a situation uh, that there was a relative abundance of funding, but at the same time, uh, this took capacities away from uh, searching for alternatives, searching, uh, finding new models or innovation, but made innovation also unnecessary. Organizations could feel that if they move from project to project, do the same things, business and usual, over and over, they're fine. And um, in the, under these circumstances, um, came 2010 uh, with uh, the government led by Fidesz coming into power, which changed uh, the, games of the, uh, the rules of the game and created again a new situation for which this, let's say, bec uh, civil society which has become a bit lazy uh, was not really prepared uh, to, um, to work with. 
uh, wasn't really prepared to, to handle the new situation. We could really see in the first years of the 2010s uh, that civil society was very much paralyzed in a sort of a state of now what? Where do we um, move from here? Um, and um, this can be shown very well uh, also by through studies and numbers. One of the longest standing uh, measurement uh, in the region is the Civil, society, Civil Sustainability Index uh, compiled by the USAID, uh, um, the US International Development uh, Agency, which has shown in the case of Hungary, but similar patterns were as well as well, uh, a big boom, a big upshoot in the 90s, then a bit of a fallback, and from the early 2000 to like 2010, there was a more or less stable situation, which in retrospect we can say was not only stable, but stagnating. And for after this stagnation came uh, the worsening uh, conditions, external conditions, which brought along worsening internal conditions in the sector as well. So here we come. Uh, to the years of the shock strategy of the Or Orban government. Uh, it started actually in 2010 with the, with the dismantling uh, of the constitution and, uh, and the rule of law, then getting into the media, and finally getting into the last resort uh, of resistance uh, or uh, critical uh, thinking, uh, which is civil society. How, how did it happen? And uh, you were in the front line with Okotas Foundation, and a couple of others, very briefly, because probably as civil society actors, uh, everybody in the room is more or less uh, aware. Oh yeah, of course. We have the picture uh, of what happens and happened in uh, Hungary. It's quite an emblematic case. But yeah, just share with us a few uh, a few insights. Well, I don't tell you a complete chronology because we would sit here all day, but. Um uh, first, maybe to start, why civil society? Why civil society was attacked in Hungary and then later on in other countries in the region as well? Uh, specifically in Hungary, what we've seen over the last eight years is a dismantling of the democratic checks and balances. Institutions uh, such as the Constitutional Court uh, has been overtaken by the gov government or made insignificant. Uh, the media is very strongly uh, dominated by the government propaganda, uh, and the political opposition is fragmented and weak. In these circumstances, civil society organizations, especially those who work on human rights or European values, are one of the last independent critical voices uh, who speak up um, in defense of democracy and uh, criticize uh, government. I'd say that the symptoms or the, the characteristics and also the stages of the so-called shrinking space in Hungary were, or consisted of, um, first came uh, the uh, media smear campaigns and vilification by leading governmental figures, which is more or less continuous since 2013 um, or so. Um, this was later accompanied by uh, administrative harassments, uh, such as harassing inspections by the tax authority and other state agencies, but which in one case in 2014 uh, culminated even in criminal accusations, including a house raid at all offices um, <clears throat> in relation to a grant program we've been managing. Um, Another symptom is the court battles. Sometimes civil society organizations have to defend themselves in court, but also they proactively do that too. Uh, in Hungary, for example, the Hungarian Helsinki Committee practically routinely uh, wins libel cases in court against the government and governmental uh, figures def in defense of their name. And the latest um, element or the latest um, component of the shrinking space is uh, the effective restrictive legislation which has we've been seeing for the last two years uh, with uh, the passing of a law on the so-called foreign funded organizations uh, in 2017 
aiming to stigmatize organizations that receive money from abroad, which was followed this year by a so-called Stop Soros legislative package, um, which focused on organizations supporting immigration, whatever that means, it's not defined, and trying to either criminalize uh, people providing support, any kind of support, uh, to immigrants and to tax organizations uh, that work on similar um, issues. Um, the first major um, uh, clash or the first major scandal of this shrinking space phenomenon in Hungary was in 2014 and it centered around the so-called EA Norway grants a funding program provided by Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein to Central European, less developed EU member states. Uh, and there the dispute was basically over who controls how money to civil society organizations is distributed. I won't go into that detail. If you are interested, uh, find me in the break. Um, but from then on, uh, this process has been ongoing uh, and continuous, uh, what we see. Um, how, do, how, does, how was civil society prepared or unprepared mm -hmm. to, to resist and to react to this? And uh, was it an, a wake-up call to civil society? Um, the EA Norway grants conflict was the great wake-up call. So at that time, uh, as I said, we've seen this now what mindset. Uh, and that was really uh, shocking events with, yeah, you know, pictures like uh, that. Um, and then at least the organizations directly affected, around uh, 60 organizations, the managers and the grantees of this grant program, uh, tried to come together uh, and organize themselves and create some kind of uh, um, um, a coalition or a structure to defend themselves. However, Unfortunately, in Hungarian civil society, there was no tradition of broad cooperation. Indeed, there had even been competitive situation. And also, uh, organizations didn't really know each other's uh, interests, uh, approaches, sensibilities. Uh, but at the same time, they, they wanted to do something big right away. So this was more or less do, uh, failed, uh, doomed to fail, and it did fail. There has been some expressions of solidarity in 2014, uh, but as the situation uh, kind of quietened down, uh, they disappeared, and basically the last two years uh, is that organizations again started in a more successful and sustainable manner to organize themselves. It started last January as a discussion among 30 plus leading uh, organizations human rights, women's rights, anti-corruption, community organizers, environmentalists, when the first news on this foreign-funded legislation came. Uh, and of this discussion, the so-called civilization network or civilization coalition uh, was born uh, with the first and direct goal uh, to uh, defend or, or to stop passing the foreign-funded uh, legislation. And during last uh, spring and summer, we have organized quite a number of spectacular um, protests. And um, uh, on the, although we were not successful in the direct goal uh, to stop the passing of the restrictive legislation, um, civilization um, achieved results in the sense uh, that um, it raised public and political attention to the issue of civil society, both within Hungary and abroad, uh, and created a working structure uh, of self-defense among organizations that, in, that are at threat, um, and um, a, a network of solidarity that can and does step up uh, whenever any of us is attacked. But also these, these events created you know, a joint experience which glues us together and which gives us the good memories upon which we can build future cooperation and working together. Uh, I would have a question uh, whether there's a difference in how civil society is uh, uh, resisting to these uh, 
in the capital and in the countryside, but I am also very much tempted to leave it for afterwards for the second phase uh, of our discussion just to, uh, to get along with the panel. Um, and also I hope that there will be uh, other testimonies because uh, indeed not only Orban government has a sort of manual on how to dismantle, uh, dismantle democratic state, but also I think we can learn from civil society also from good and bad uh, experience on how, how, to, how to better organize in the face of the contagious effect uh, of, uh, of these trends uh, which is happening uh, all across Europe, but mainly in, uh, in countries like Poland, uh, Romania, Croatia, Western Balkans. Let's go on with Val. Uh, and uh, well, we know that um, FRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency, has collected collected evidence uh, and uh, published recently a report which confirms that these are uh, really emerging trends all across Europe. And uh, yeah, please Val, uh, share with us the main findings of, uh, of the reports and also of a recent survey conducted by the FRA, but maybe in the very beginning introduce a little bit uh, the work of the FRA because maybe not everybody's uh, very much aware of, uh, of what is your mandate and what you do regularly. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, so I represent here the Fundamental Rights Agency that's a public body of the European Union, an independent EU agency working on human rights inside the EU only, so inside the EU member states. Um, our mandate is that we advise governments and EU institutions on the implementation of human rights in the area of EU law. That still uh, is a restriction, but it's still many different fundamental rights that we, that we work on. For example, asylum migration, non-discrimination, rights of the child, Roma inclusion, access to justice, etc. So broad human rights mandate. And um, the advice that we give to governments and EU institutions, um, we don't take it just from our own expertise, but we, we provide evidence-based advice. That means we collect data, we, we, we do legal analysis, we collect data on this situation on the ground, how are people experiencing the reality of fundamental rights implementation. Um, and with this data, we do an analysis, and based on this analysis, we provide our advice. So um, in the area of civil society space, uh, I have to say we had not originally planned to work on that, really. We do have um, strong cooperation with civil society, so I'm responsible for our uh, cooperation platform. It's called Fundamental Rights Platform, and it's an organization that, um, it's, a, it's a network that brings together over 700 organizations uh, from across the EU. And any organizations here who, who are not yet registered for the database are, of course, invited. What we, we use this network, it's a loose network. There's no membership, but we try it to, uh, on the one hand, give our own information out to civil society, on the findings and on the recommendations that we give um, so that civil society can, on the one hand, help us disseminate that, but also use it themselves for advocacy. But on the other hand, we also try to get input from civil society on the situation on the ground and on the issues that we also should be looking into. So it was actually in the framework of our civil society cooperation that more and more organizations came and said, there is an issue, there is an issue. And um, no, I have to say, really, not only the organizations from Hungary at all, but from across. And in the beginning, it was, of course, the finance. And, and then when we, sp when we spoke with policymakers, they said, yeah, yeah, of course, NGOs always complain they don't have enough money, which is maybe also true. But we still, from the many conversations we had, we still thought there is something else. And then we started, uh, we tried to find out for ourselves initially, for, for the sake of our own cooperation with civil society, what is going on. And when we didn't find much material at all at EU comparative level, we decided to do our own study. And um, I have to say some of the patterns that Vera described, we see actually across, um, I think uh, Jean-Marc Warren said there are specificities, but there are, you said there are also similarities across, um, and we see that as well. So we see a lot of patterns. And what we were trying to find is the patterns behind uh, the issues, the challenges that civil society organizations are facing. I don't have much time, so I will just give the headings. Um, but when we started, we started with an expert meeting of 40 civil society experts on the issue. We put out a mind map um, on the wall, and we had over 50 different types of challenges that civil society organizations can face. And we clustered them into four main topics. 
and I will just briefly mention these four so that you get a sense of what we mean. The first one is legal obstacles. So laws obviously affect the operations of civil society. Initially, we all think, of course, of freedom of assembly, freedom of association, and there we have seen some restrictions under the counterterrorism efforts, but then there are also many other laws that maybe not, don't initially come to mind when you think of civil society, such as tax laws, uh, lobby laws, transparency laws, anti-money laundering laws, and there people always get very surprised because, of course, NGOs don't engage in, in money laundering, but we have seen that in a number of countries, actually, the side effects, unintended side effects mostly, of uh, anti-money laundering legislation has led to bank accounts being frozen, etc. So there's a lot of different legal areas that need to be considered. And what we recommend to policymakers is that really uh, ex ante assessments are needed on legislation and on the effect on civil society. If there are questions, we can maybe do it later in the conversation, or I will also still be here in the break. The second one is the access to funding. I think that's the most known, so we'll be very short on that. What we see is that, um, of course, uh, from the perspective of civil society, it's never satisfactory. But from the perspective of someone looking at fundamental rights independently, as we do, we see a number of obstacles that are partly, okay, the amounts of funding, but also the activities for which funding is provided. Um, I might come to that later. There, there is hardly any core funding or infrastructure funding, which is a real challenge. Funding is often really short time, which doesn't allow for sustainability. I see you nodding. I mean, you know all of this. Um, what we see, uh, no, I will come to that later. The third point is the difficulties or challenges in uh, accessing the decision-making process. So for civil society to give input to lawmaking, to, to new legislation, but also to policies. And we see a number of challenges there. So um, consultations don't work very well often. The timelines are too short. The tool chosen is mostly online consultations that's sometimes really good, but sometimes really not the best tool, etc. cetera. Um, so again, challenges here as well. And then the fourth area is what we call a safe space. And safe space obviously means the whole the area that you are also mentioning, the threats, attacks, smear campaigns, um, online, on Facebook, at, um, threats, etc. But also what we have detected is a number of physical attacks, people being beaten up, attacks on the premises, graffiti on the walls, etc. But also under this area falls the digital security. So have there been digital security attacks, the surveillance, and also an area that's normally not mentioned by anyone, this is why I'm mentioning it, and that's what we call the self-care or psychosocial well-being of activists. We see that it doesn't get a lot of attention, but we see that there are quite some challenges. Um, again, I can go into this later if there's an interest. So we published this uh, report in January, and it had quite some feedback. Um, we were also invited to many uh, member states to present it there. And what we saw is that how important it is to bring these issues. When we set out, we had in mind, of course, our mandate to advise the EU institutions and the member states. But what we saw along is what an expert with whom I spoke very early on in the project said, told me, yeah, yeah, it's, it's important that you raise uh, awareness with policymakers, but you will also need to raise awareness with civil society. In the beginning, I was quite surprised about this comment. But as I go along and I speak with a lot of activists, I see that really it's very complex. I spoke of over 50 different issues, some of them intended, some unintended, a different situation really in every member state. Um, and so it's really, and then the patterns reinforcing each other, so it's really quite complex. So this is also why I'm happy to speak at an event with many civil society organizations, because I think it's really important to understand where these issues come from and how, what, what they can be, consist of. We then went on to a consult, you wanted to ask the consultation, I briefly want to say. So the first study, uh, this report, by the way, we have copies outside, that was based on official data that we got through our research network and on some expert interviews. What we also wanted to know is, so how is the situation for civil society organizations themselves? How do they experience it? And we did a consultation, online consultation with our platform, the 700 organizations, um, in September. And what we saw from the feedback was, first of all, that broadly the patterns are confirmed. So indeed, the perception of civil society, of those who responded, 
is that uh, situation has deteriorated in the past three years. They detail us the challenges that they're facing in the different areas which correspond to our challenges. What was interesting was that we saw some of the things that we thought were really a big problem, they didn't rate so high, but some of the other issues was rated higher than we expected. Um, again, I can go into detail later. What's, what's very relevant in this consultation is that for the first time there are any ideas of the extent of the attacks and threats, because there is no official data about this. So for the first time we have indication and in, the, in this consultation, or oh, it's not yet public, it will be published next Monday, at the European Com Commission Colloquium on Fundamental Rights. But I will give you one figure here, and that is that more than half of the organizations said they have experienced threats and attacks, and more than half said they have been targeted in media campaigns or smear campaigns. Um, yeah. I would have uh, also a question, but I think I will, uh, I will keep it for the second part of the discussion on um, what, in your opinion, uh, would be the role, what can we expect and what the EU can do and should do alongside its mandate and the FRA also, uh, to better protect not only the values but also uh, those who defend them on the ground? Yeah. Uh, because indeed we saw that uh, the EU was quite efficient in, uh, in san sanctioning non-compliance uh, with the economic rules, <laughs> but it's not so efficient after all in sanctioning or uh, um, even uh, reacting to uh, non-compliance with the rule of law and, uh, and our very fundamental values. Um, I suggest we go on with Vedran and uh, I think it's important to put all these trends into a, into a much broader perspective and to discuss a little bit about uh, the roots uh, and the long tra trends behind this whole crisis of democracy, uh, the crisis of liberalism, both probably economically and uh, politically, and uh, is there a link between the crisis of democracy and the rise of authoritarianism in the East? Because look, uh, 30 years after, after uh, the fall of authoritarianism, we go back there. Uh, so I would like to hear some insights. What did it go wrong? Uh, was it uh, not the good moment in time <laughs> when the transition happened? Can you, can you give us some insights? This. So, uh, thanks, Alexandrina. Rina. Thanks, organizers, for inviting. Uh, and uh, just to kick it off, uh, this is a million-dollar question, Alexandrina, <laughs> so that I cannot answer, but I'll at least try to give some hints. But before I do so, uh, there is just, uh, I mean, while listening to the introductory speeches and, and to the greetings, uh, and just going back in my mind to a similar conference that took place three weeks ago in Belgrade, where we were discussing uh, almost like the same issues, uh, a kind of a paradoxical moment popped up in my mind. And this is the fact that basically within, uh, uh, let's put it under quotation marks, our communities, uh, we face, at least I face, uh, a, a, a huge dilemma. So when, if I would go out uh, to each of you uh, and ask you whether you support and what do you think about the Hungarian government under, under Orban, I will probably get uh, quite a similar answer from almost all of you. Uh, and this paradoxical moment is the following. As of when we are in our circles, uh, at least I face sometimes this moment of Grand Hawk Day. So we go from a conference to a conference, we see each other, we like each other, we hug each other, we kiss each other after the dinner for goodbye, whatever we do. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, on a serious side, in terms of, of, of topics and, and the fight that we are fighting, uh, something which is in vain is always like intrinsically bound uh, to our efforts. So this is one part of it. Uh, this Groundhog Day, it's repeating. But on the other hand side, uh, this is the only way basically to go. Uh, so, and I always remember this quote by Hannah Arendt when, when she argues that uh, the beginning is the supreme capacity of men. She, uh, not, she was not putting women into the quotation, but she said the beginning, the new is the supreme capacity of men and women, I would add. Uh, and, and what I do believe we are able to, 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 to give birth to 
uh, even if you face this Groundhog Day, momentum is some kind of, uh, of, of, of something new, some new energy. But we can discuss it then later on when we probably touch upon the future of Europe and then facing the European elections. But in terms of your question, uh, just to bring it, to narrow it down, uh, what, what I see right now in the moment going on, and this is a consequence of several developments uh, that have been accompanying Europe and the world in the last two decades. Uh, uh, Michael Ignatieff, a very wise uh, man in a fighting mood uh, that now has to come to Vienna. Uh, uh, in 2014, he wrote a paper for the New York Review of Books uh, called on the, uh, are the authoritarians winning? Uh, question mark. And, he said, and he said, there is something new that we are facing on the global agenda. And this is a new chameleon type uh, uh, or new chameleon. And this new chameleon is uh, capitalist in economy, it's nationalist uh, in ideology, and it's authoritarian in politics, in governance. Uh, and uh, this new chameleon, and, and I do believe that today, in 2018, even more than in 2014, we soon see a new a development of a kind of a new illiberal or authoritarian convergence, where paradoxically the East and the West and Southeastern Europe, where I'm come from, as I'm from Bosnia originally, the candidate countries, they uh, come together uh, in this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, semi-authoritarian, illiberal type of convergence. What is, uh, 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 and this is the, the, the starting, so we have to name the animal. We have to name the animal that we are facing. And I believe this new animal that we are facing is authoritarian, and at the same time, uh, it's, uh, and I will just elaborate in a second, it's also neoliberal. And this kind of a neoliberal turn uh, is the one that explains the, the rise of this, this, this uh, authoritarian animal. And what is this chameleon type of, 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 of animal? Uh, representing, and this is what makes it, what, what, what it makes uh, very dangerous from my point of view. It is, uh, at, it combines the best of both sides, pretending to be democratic, and I call it democratic mimicry, and you can hear it, I mean, I was just at this conference in Beggar, I was listening to Vucic, to the Serbian uh, President Vucic, uh, speaking about LGBT and, and whatever, I mean, he can speak whatever you take openness, free speech, whenever you need, make Europe great for all, make whatever you want. Uh, and uh, this kind of a preaching uh, democracy and claiming that he uh, is representing democracy is a common trend that Orban shares, that uh, all of the guys shares. And this kind of a momentum where you pretend to be democratic and claim democracy for yourself, but at the same time you destroy the very roots of democracy by controlling press uh, and controlling media, going against the civil society, uh, uh, under, uh, undermining the rule of law and turning it into rule by law, etc., etc. That makes it, that makes it uh, so functional in a way, and that makes it also difficult to be attacked. And this is the debate that we have. I mean, we, we can discuss it in Austria, we can discuss it in, in so many countries, basically. This is always that kind of, we go two steps rhetorically, then we go one step uh, back, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is one momentum. But the second momentum, uh, and this is a very, uh, very important and interesting one, and just recently, the other day, uh, Pankaj Mishra, you might know from this book, uh, what's the name of the book? A the Time of Age of Anger or something. He claimed uh, in a paper, and I just printed it out for, uh, for, for today, in a paper published in Los Angeles Review of Books, uh, I'm quoting Pankaj Mishra, the liberal order is the incubator for authoritarianism. Quite interesting, quite strong. And what is, what is Pankaj Mishra's uh, 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 claim? And I do believe there is something uh, intrinsically important in this claim. Uh, the way how the societies uh, in the West and globally have started developing from this end of the history, which was, by the way, oh, this is so funny. Uh, Fukuyama just published a new book on identity. And you have to listen to the people that are always wrong. So he, 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 he took it wrong in 1989 with the end of history. And I believe he's also, to a certain degree, wrong with this new book. But this is another debate. Uh, but uh, what, what I want to say is basically that this kind of a uh, promise of, of linear development towards democracy uh, within a neoliberal paradigm that precisely in the peripheries of Europe were, uh, was performed and executed in a very, uh, very uh, harsh top-down way uh, has created a situation 
where you have uh, a kind of an emergence of, of new neoliberal rationality, or, or to put it differently, neoliberal common sense that uh, we all have intrinsically, uh, in a way, inhalated uh, by the air that we aim in the shopping centers that we go to. Uh, and this is basically replacing social bonds uh, with uh, market rationality, uh, with predictability, pragmatism, uh, with uh, everything is basically subordinated uh, to the monetary logic uh, and to the markets. So this is what I face and what I see when I go to the shopping center in Belgrade, which is just a kind of a, for a, a, a to, to put a, 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 a dot on, on, on it. So basically, uh, I do believe there is a certain type of, of uh, authoritarianism that goes with that kind of uh, neoliberal rationality that undermines the very basic social bonds that is engaged in depoliticizing, that is uh, going back to the individual, which is the core of the liberal. Uh, but in the neoliberal reading of this, of this liberal, this is what Pankaj Mishra is arguing, you end up in destroying the social tissue. You end up in destroying the social networks. Uh, and you end up in atomization, where then guys and authoritarian leaders are popping up and promising uh, the blue from the sky, uh, or the moon, or whatever you take. Uh, and uh, you diminish or limit the possibilities of livable life. Uh, and livable life, you know, this is, this is what uh, uh, Judith Butler is using when she wants to describe this dilemma. Uh, of how neoliberalism is, is, is destroying democracy. So livable life and the fact that we face a lot of precariat uh, uh, and a lot of destruction of the social tissue is basically creating perfect preconditions uh, to pick it up uh, and to start using whatever techniques you can imagine. Uh, you can use panopticum, uh, you can control, uh, you can deliver a bit of goods, security, so then you will see in Azerbaijan, uh, Aliyev will tell you, no, we, I mean, we have no criminals, no drugs, everything is clean, we offer, we distribute, etc., etc. And this kind of logic uh, is uh, lying in, uh, in, in bed with, uh, with uh, uh, just to, to use this metaphor, uh, with authoritarian and liberalism or authoritarian tendencies. Uh, and we should nowadays, in 2018, not be foolish to believe uh, that market economy, liberalism, etc., etc., always have to go hand in hand only with democracies, which we all hope. This is our Grand Hog Day. Uh, but it is perfectly, uh, I mean, market economy and capitalism is, is perfectly prom engaged in promiscuity. I mean, it's lying in bed with authoritarianism and creating a situation and preconditions for what we face uh, today. So that was kind of a, uh, just an attempt to, to put it into a broader picture. Uh, which is very pessimistic, but at the same time, as we, when we then continue, I believe, uh, the, 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 going back to Hannah Arendt, the very moment of this pessimistic account of the world that we live in, in today is the moment of motivation and hope uh, and, and creates this kind of a quest for real utopia, something new that has to be built today in order to be functional in the future. Indeed, and uh, not to completely depress, <laughs> indeed we see uh, huge waves of uh, civic and popular uh, re-engagement, reclaiming rights, liberties, uh, space and democracy. Um, uh, I think that uh, we will keep the second question for, for, for the second phase of the debate. Uh, I would like to get more a little bit into this issue of uh, individualism, the loss of social bonds, uh, and how in the current situation where um, practically uh, we came in competition for rights uh, and for victimhood as well, uh, where should we look for, um, for um, agency uh, to rebuild solidarity and to rebuild those bonds? Uh, should we look at the institutions? Should we look at the political forces? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, across the political spectrum in Europe today, we don't see that many political forces which are carrying uh, our values and our agendas. Uh, the other ones are becoming more and more vocal. So I think these are interesting questions to develop, but I would very much like to encourage you to take the empty chair. I'm a little bit worried that nobody did so far. Um, probably um, 
uh, you thought that we will be t uh, taking more time, but I guess that since we are a little bit uh, behind the schedule, um, we could now introduce the audience and then we come back uh, to the panel with a second round of questions. Uh, would anybody want to step up? Yes. Would you be the icebreaker? Please. <laughs> you have been designated to. <laughs> yes. Very spontaneous. Uh, please introduce yourself. Is that one? Uh, my name is Gabriele Gerbesitz. I'm on the board of EGO and I'm the senior advisor in IG Kultur Österreich, which is a platform for uh, cultural initiatives in Austria. Um, I promise to make the icebreaker because it's a re really um, uncomfortable situation. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm still caught in, in, um, in the idea I was listening to you and I'm, uh, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about how to find this unity, this alliance, the coalition with uh, the other in Austria, Austrians, um, uh, civil society um, organizations to stand up clearly and to find the common uh, narrative to make a new storytelling how to how to make it and I really would like to to ask you did you did you do it all by yourself or did you find partners um, in in Hungary to make these things if I allowed to <laughs> ask a question thank you very much um, uh, who do you mean by yourself I mean as I said civilization is the let's say the the inner circle of membership is like 34 major nationwide NGOs uh, but um, its declaration has been joined by more than 300 organizations from all over the country which is kind of the outer circle um, uh, but of course so these are the organizations that work together uh, or still work together on in our defense and and trying to turn the the trend and the tide but of course European uh, solidarity the expressions of solidarity were very important as well so specifically last summer uh, last spring when uh, this foreign funded legislation was in the Parliament um, there was huge European mobilization. Civil society or Europe, for example, collected the endorsement of more than 500 organizations from all over Europe. Uh, European funders, donors had a separate um, um, declaration. But of course, also all those organizations that, or uh, intergovernmental organizations that defend democracy, uh, came out publicly condemning the, the government steps. Um, but uh, so there is, well, I mean, these intangible terms did not lead to a change of the situation. However, these are very important from the mental, psychological uh, uh, point of view. And I think uh, there is a, a, a big power in, in, in such corporations and, and being there for, for one another. Um, as for what to do, um, I also have this Groundhog Day um, feeling. Uh, whenever, I'm, whenever I'm asked this, I usually say there are four C's to keep in mind. Uh, that is constituency, community, uh, communication, and coalitions. So uh, start with the very, or at least in all contexts, that's what I can say, to start with the very local communities, to create groups and communities of active citizens who are willing to to mobilize who are willing to step up in their own small issues and based on these communities you can create a constituency of people who are committed who support NGOs who are who can be mobilized and, and become active this requires a lot of communication much more creative much more proactive communication that we do these days um, a very personal communication also showing exactly what we do, why is that good for the society, how it helps people, how it makes people's lives better in very concrete terms. Storytelling is the, the buzzword here. And the last C is the coalition building that I've been talking about already. I mean, 
I don't say that this is, will be uh, a quick fix. It's a very long-term and quite res resource-intensive undertaking, which in the first periods doesn't really bring any very visible results. Uh, but seeing what's happened in Hungary, it is my firm conviction that this is the homework that we have forgotten to do uh, in the prior decade, and now we suffer the consequences and we cannot spare these exercises and these efforts. Is that answering your question? I think uh, I can now, uh, this builds the bridge with uh, what I was interested in to learn uh, uh, previously. How how is the situation at the countryside? Uh, because if in Budapest we see very well that, okay, uh, resistance is being organized, it's quite visible, even though uh, media is completely hijacked, but still civil society in Budapest is quite well equipped uh, to react. But then in the countryside, uh, how, how are you facing it? How do you go back to those constituencies? Mm. And what, to what they can rely, actually, to, uh, to do the work they do? It's a very good question and a very difficult one too. Um, in Hungary, in every respect, there is a, bit, a huge gap between the capital and the countryside and that is reflected on the level of civic organizing as well. What we see on the countryside is that organizations are much uh, weaker. They try to adapt to the current situation. They try to express loyalty to, to the power. Um, and try to uh, distance themselves for anything that could be seen as, as controversial. Especially in smaller places, the local dependencies and the local institutions, the mayor or whatever, are very strong. Um, but we are working uh, with several um, local communities using the tools and methods of community organizing ranging from small villages to middle-sized towns. And we are seeing that it is possible to, to achieve results uh, locally. The question is, and that's something for the future, and that's a direction we would like to work in, whether the gap between the local and the national level can be uh, bridged. Whether the uh, these small local initiatives can be organized into a network that could work together and, and expand uh, its area or its scope of, of work. That's something um, uh, still to be seen. I have hopes because I don't see any other, other way. <laughs> just no, I just wanted to add very briefly. Um, also after many conversations we already had with Vera in the past. I think from our external observation what I saw, because you asked how is it possible, how can we organize? Um, our observation was that indeed very often uh, organizations are competitors for the same funds, for the same attention, for the same access to policymakers. So it's initially difficult. But what we observed is when the pressure is rising, these things sort of become less and less important and the coalition building becomes more and more important. And I think for me that's what I have observed in Hungary. It also, you said it failed in the first place. It, it started to work when the pressure got really big, unfortunately. Yeah? And so what, what we are always saying is to both to civil society organizations but also to donors, to civil society organizations, really the coalition building, someone mentioned it before in the opening speeches, the coalition building really is key uh, beyond the differences that there are, beyond the competition for funds. But it's really important to, to understand what is the shared ground, what is the shared purpose. It's not needed to agree on everything, but to find that shared purpose you're, you're fighting for together, the clarity of that purpose. And um, the other point for donors also to understand the importance of this type of funding that is needed. There is hardly any funding for coalition building, uh, uh, neither by public nor private. A, a few, there are a few, but if you look at the big, um, not only the public, but also the big private donors, there are a few who fund some coalition building, but mostly international coalition building. National and local coalition building is also important. And then uh, also the, um, the, the community engagement, I really like, you said, community engagement. But community in engagement is also a skill, you need to know how to do it. And I don't see a lot of capacity building offered on the community engagement either. Um, and also not often the awareness um, that this is so needed. So this is something we saw from our report as well that, I mean, we didn't write a lot of critical things about civil society organizations because the focus was a different one. 
but one of the things that we would recommend to civil society organizations really on the capacity building, not to stick only to the traditional how to do a good communication strategy and how to write funding proposals, but also how to cooperate, how to, how, what are good engagement methods, tools, skills, um, etc. I think this goes very much uh, along uh, what we, we also uh, call for in, inside civil society, and I think these are good recommendations also for the European Commission here uh, to, to take into account when developing uh, the rights and values, the new rights and values program we will discuss uh, about in the, in the second panel. We are lucky enough to have somebody else on the empty chair. Uh, please introduce yourself. My name is Maarten de Groot. I work for the ECI campaign on the reform of the European Citizens Initiative from the side of civil society. Um, my question concerns the animal that has been put out there um, with two phases, the authoritarian phase and the neoliberal phase. Um, and it concerns the role of civil society vis-a-vis -vis party politics, I would say. And because I think we're, in these scenes, we're not used to calling the beast by the name because we are politically independent as civil society. Um, for the moment, I, I'm not saying it's the beast, but at least one beast out there that I think uh, sometimes needs to be called by the name is the, the European People's Party. Um, and for me, this, the simple fact that um, the new Spitzenkandidat, which is the democratic innovation of the European Union, um, um, of the biggest political party, which is the biggest chance to become Commission President, uh, according to all accounts, is supported by both Angela Merkel on the one side, which in my view is to some extent the embodiment indeed of neoliberal technocratic Europe, and by Viktor Orban, which, if anything, is the embodiment of um, the authoritarian Europe, and that size the two phases of the beast, I would say. So, on, on the one hand, I think we are not used to calling the beast by the name, uh, which I think is a question we need to reflect upon, and if we can afford doing that. But, if anything, my point is more that um, um, Alexandrina just mentioned, um, we don't see the forces, political forces outside, uh, out there um, that challenge this or that truly stand up for civil society or that truly have a different alternative. There are movements out there. Um, of course, maybe the Greens are, are, uh, is, a, is, is a political group in the Euro European Parliament that some of us feel close to, but there are also a movement like the U Democracy in Europe movement 2025. Well, Janus Varoufakis is the, the most famous founder, of course, of this movement, European Spring. Um, and my question, uh, sorry for being too long maybe, but my question is um, about the role of civil society. The way I right now talk about party politics, it's not so common in these settings. Is it not time that we as civil society um, give more visibility to progressive movements out there that are trying to build an alternative Europe? Because we do, we do need people from inside the institutions, from inside party politics to fight for the things that we stand for. But we also have a, have a role to play in supporting them and in, in giving them visibility because they are not really visible for many people out there. So I hope that's clear. Adrian, I think you should take this. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes there are, there are like questions where you don't have the definite answer, uh, which makes it, makes, makes it interesting. Uh, but but I, I see like few avenues and few lines of, of thought and action uh, that, that that can be pursued here. Uh, so the first one, the, f the first one is is something very fundamental, and it goes towards uh, emotions uh, uh, in, in in politics. Uh, right now we have, and I mean there are so many books about politics of fear. Nothing new. Uh, Marta Nussbaum has just published a new book, Monarchy of Fear, uh, where she then argues in the end towards uh, rediscovering joy and optimism uh, and hope uh, as a kind of a political engine uh, that, that can change something. Uh, I believe uh, one uh, important first step, and it has to uh, happen in the next few months and years to come, is basically to reverse this emotional dilemma that was created by, uh, by right-wing, populist, nationalist, however you call them, uh, uh, parties, movements, and people. Uh, and reversing dilemma uh, 
is something that seems sometimes quite impossible. As I mean, when you when you look to Hungary and and and, and you hunt the, the the refugees, even though there are no refugees, but then you accept one uh, refugee, Nikola Gruevski the former authoritarian head of government of Macedonia was just granted asylum within 12 hours, uh, then, uh, then uh, y you feel that somewhere uh, in the common sense or in the good sense of what we have in Europe, there is this kind of underlying, underlying uh, optimist and joyful stands towards uh, politics, society, etc., etc. This one needs to be rediscovered somehow. Uh, I mean, this is always a kind of a futile exercise, but an exercise that has to happen to a certain degree. So this kind of uh, rediscovering political emotions, uh, joy, uh, optimism. Uh, and there are many good examples. I mean, Macedonians in this cover for revolution from 2016, they were running like the whole revolution on the basis of emotions attacking Gruevsky and his politics of fear by creating uh, and, and, and focusing on joys. But, I mean, emotions are not, never sufficient. I mean, emotions are fine, we need them, but they're not, never sufficient as they don't easily translate into political programs. Uh, what we do believe, uh, I mean, uh, as, as a second step, I do believe that we have to fa ask these very fundamental questions to all the citizens, to all of us. What is the society that we want to live in? And what is uh, basically the, the society that you face right now? If you start playing this democratic mimicry, mimicry semi-authoritarian game uh, uh, that is produced or reproduced as a major narrative, uh, then the citizens don't know what to think about Orban, Gruevsky, Vucic. Part of them believes they are Democrats, part of them believes they are bastards, uh, part of them uh, are just uh, apathic uh, uh, and don't, they don't think anything because they, they, they are marginalized. Uh, and I believe to speak out that what we have in Europe is uh, reshuffling at the new beginning of, beginning of authoritarian history on the European soil that is endangering underlying values and achievements of the European project and of democratic liberal order is something that has to be said, that has to be spelled out. And when you spell it out as dramatically as it is, uh, then you will probably, and I do believe, initiate a process where the citizens have to ask themselves what society do they want to live in. Uh, and, and, and facing this harsh dilemma, uh, and facing this harsh dilemma in front of the European elections, uh, might be might be a useful useful uh, thing and the third one just very briefly i mean we have to ask a question that we usually don't uh, ask or we ask it but but uh, sometimes in a very strange way so uh, uh, the the question is what is happening this is the question for us in the civil society academia like progressives so what is happening or what is going to happen if what we wish uh, to happen is not happening so what is going to happen, and even Krastev asks these questions from time to time, and he's very good in putting, 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 it in, putting the finger in the wounds, uh, but what is happening, and we will have European elections that will end up in results that we don't like. Like, this is a huge, huge, uh, a hu a huge, uh, I would say huge, uh, how, how you say it, uh, I'm just missing the English word, uh, the probability. That the probability is quite high that we are going to face what we don't like to be faced. And asking these kind of tough questions, uh, looking into the future, might then mobilize and activate uh, or initiate this process uh, uh, where we are all engaged in, but the majority of the people out of the streets is not. So, uh, I mean, so just like a few hints, I mean, these are all like very complicated questions and, and, and there are no easy answers, but just like few hints. Uh, uh, on, on, on how to go and how to move forward on this avenue. Sounds like an invitation for civil society to take an even more important role and even a lot more responsibility <coughs> on our shoulders. Um, another MP chair, please introduce yourself. Jean Robert from uh, the European Civic Forum. Um, first, I would maybe like to share with you uh, something which came come from my age about uh, about uh, neoliberalism and uh, and uh, democracy uh, the implementation of uh, the neoliberal concept inside the economy and countries uh, if we look back 
has always been carried on with autocratic, if not dictatorship, in a dictatorship manner. The, 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 the first one was uh, Pinochet after uh, 73 coup. But if we go back to, to, to Thatcher, if we go back to Reagan, um, it was also with uh, uh, destroying uh, part of what was making cohesion in society. Even if I think today, I'm sorry to say this in this audience about Macron, what he tried to implement from uh, a more uh, liberal agenda that what France is used to have, uh, he does it, and he say he does it in an, authoritarian, in an authoritarian way, because if not, he would not succeed in doing it. It's very interesting for us to remember this. Why? Because then I come to my second point, which is linked to the first one. How democracy and uh, raising inequality can be under the same roof? I think it's a question that we have today in Europe. The neoliberal agenda say two things, more wealth, more inequality, both. So when you are in this agenda and inequality is or raising or consequences for inequality make big fears in a big chunk of the society, how it connects with the democratic values. I think really it's one of our uh, things on the agenda. And from civil society point of view, we have to answer this question with the tools we have in our hands. There are other tools which are in other hands. Politicians can have tools in their hand to answer this question. We are civil society, we are activists, we are acting in society because we see the inequalities and we want more equality which goes through more access to rights for all. We are in one country, we look who has problems and we look how to help. In any society with the divisions, with the inequality which exists in this society. Our way of tackling the agenda is to say anyone who has not access to rights have to be on our view and has to benefit from civil society involvement. And when we say this, we have to do two more things. I think it was you, uh, Alexandrina, who was telling us, I don't remember if it was this morning or at the beginning of this afternoon, that very often when people act for rights, first they don't say that they act for rights, they just act. And second, if they feel that in the society what they are doing uh, is not accepted by everyone. They do, but they don't claim. They act and they don't claim. And I think that one of the things we have to do as civil society activists is to make that what we do, we claim. That if we fight for values, we claim that we fight for values. It is, in a sense, what we are going to do with MEGA on the 10th of December. We are proud of doing what we do, and we want you to know that when we act, we act for everybody to have access to right. That's what is the slogan. And I think that on civil society point of view, that's what we have to bring to the political debate. But we have also to find partners on the political scale. And here, maybe you will have more answers than me. This almost sounds like a conclusion, <laughs> actually, to the debate. Uh, but I would like to conclude before uh, getting also to, the, to another stage of discussing really the future of Europe and, and what we have currently on the table. As you said, there's a high probability that uh, we will have uh, results, outcomes of the European elections. We will not like that much, uh, especially that now uh, there is a division line which is set by... Uh, by the liberals, uh, led by Macron, uh, meaning the liberals, we don't know what kind of liberals, but the liberals against the illiberals. And in this kind of divide, there's not so much room to discuss, as you said, the kind of uh, liberalism we want and the kind of Europe we want. So we, we are very much also uh, disappointed by the fact that there are high chances that the whole debate is being hijacked 
by this only uh, uh, dichotomy between uh, liberalism and liberal, uh, illiberalism. Beforehand, it was more or less Europe. So once again, the what kind of Europe question, there's not so much room uh, to, to be asked and to be answered. So once again, uh, in civil society spheres, I think, uh, we need to take on a lot of responsibility to take up that question, to open up spaces, debate, and to try uh, to be agenda setters when the campaign will be really open. Uh, and this is something, of course, we, uh, we are trying to do with the mega campaign and uh, also with the No Day Without Us action. Um, but yeah, let's, let's try to, to approach the concluding moment and uh, do, do another round. Uh, and let's get back to this uh, European dimension. So we will, I think, uh, once again go back to the roots and to, uh, to what the EU can do uh, to strengthen and to, uh, to protect more and better the space for civil society. You already made some recommendations, uh, but I, I think you have uh, some more. Also, maybe uh, what can civil society do or in what how, how should we be self-reflective uh, about our strengths and weaknesses? And then to end up, uh, Vedran, on uh, European perspective and future of Europe, where to look for, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and what do we need to seize as civil society now? Wow, that's uh, quite complicated. Um, however, um, I'd like to stick uh, with, um, with the civil society case in a more narrow terms rather than focus on the whole European political landscape. And uh, uh, because I think there is a lot uh, the EU could do in this respect as well, because what we see is that civil society matters uh, remain largely member state competencies. So the EU doesn't really have much to say about civic sector as a whole. Um, and, in that, um, and that could be changed and that could be improved. And I think a very important step in the good direction uh, is the proposal uh, for a new funding mechanism that was also mentioned in the opening um, uh, that would uh, go to supporting uh, organizations that uh, really focus on upholding European values and democracy um, and which would uh, be made accessible or hopefully made accessible to broader circle of NGOs, not just the big European uh, networks. So providing a new funding instrument would be really important and currently there is uh, quite a lot of uh, civil society advocacy going on from different directions uh, to move this forward. Um, that's actually something that, that might bring result even before the elections. Uh, but there are several other tools that I could imagine. Uh, for example, creating a European, Europe level or Europe wide uh, organizational form so that you can register as a European NGO without having to be registered in a specific, under, uh, for a specific country. That would give you a much bigger flexibility for organizations. Um, or, or creating uh, a system of stronger monitoring of what's happening in the different countries and, and creating a warning or flagging system that could uh, uh, raise attention to, um, to attacks or, or to, uh, to negative developments. Um, something like what the FRA did, but in a more regular, more uh, systematic way, not just a one-off um, report. Um, and I could think about some further uh, measures. So basically what I'm missing is a European um, level policy on civil society, uh, which I think is not impossible, or I hope is not impossible to make, though it might be a longer term um, process. Indeed, we have been facing this uh, also uh, along the years, because ever since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty and the opening up of a space uh, and a legal basis uh, for a dialogue between institutions and civil society. We are still reclaiming that space and there's still a way, long way to go. Uh, but these are issues that are on, on the agendas of the European networks and European platforms which are engaged 
in relations with the European institutions and uh, we are trying to make sure that we are heard uh, by the current uh, debates at the EU level also in the process of the negotiation of the next multi-annual uh, financial framework and the priorities which will be put on the table and how the, the EU budget will be distributed, how the values uh, and the fundamental rights will be <laughs> in a way supported. Um, Val. Yeah. Okay, so how the EU could support civil society space. I think I could speak about at least an hour. So it's really challenging now to condense it shortly. But I would like to start with saying that how could the EU, I, I, I think, I know, the EU is already doing a lot to support civil society space. And some of it is more visible, but some of it is also less visible for a good reason, because sometimes it's more strategic to do things in the closed doors. And a, a lot of this is happening. Um, I have five points that I want to go in, and I think for every point I might will already also say a bit what is already happening and what else could be done. Um, as a starting point, it's important to understand that the EU can do what is EU competence. We know very well that in the area of civil society space, a lot of things are national competence. So the EU uh, can find ways of dealing with things, such as we found a way to produce this report, which is on civic space, but it's also limited in its competence. So this you need to bear in mind when you ask what can the EU do. Also the EU, the EU is a lot of different things. Yeah. So there is the European Commission, the Parliament, the Council, there are the agencies, uh, there is, yeah, and uh, the Economic and Social Committee, for example, has also been quite active. So there are different actors and they partly uh, can do the same, but they partly are also set up in this way to complement each other. And so I cannot go into all the details of this complexity now, um, but I will, I will try. Um, the first step, I think, for what the EU can do is to understand itself what is going on, uh, because that's the first, so the evidence base, that's the first basis to do something useful about anything, really. I mean, nobody would dream of doing a fiscal policy without financial data. Let's, let's be really concrete about what are the issues. And there what the EU has done is, of course, the report by the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also uh, the European Commission itself is uh, organizing a big colloquium on fundamental rights next week, where the question of civil society and democracy is the key topic. Um, um, the Economic and Social Committee has done several so-called opinions a year ago on the EU financing of NGOs and now a recent one on the new uh, instrument that you mentioned, the Justice, Rights and Values um, Fund by the European Commission. So there is already on the level of understanding the situation also uh, quite some things. So my first point is, and on this basis of the understanding, is what the EU can do and is doing is to raise awareness about the situation. I mentioned our report. I know that the European Commission is in contact with a number of member states on different issues on the level of raising awareness as well. Um, there are open letters, there are closed letters, there is social media, there are tweets. There is a lot going on, uh, raising awareness with the public authorities, but I think, as I said before, it's also important to raise the awareness with civil society and with the general public, maybe not only or so much about the challenges, but also about the value, the added value of civil society. Um, um, when policymakers, that can be national, but also EU policymakers raising their voice on saying civil society is a key, is crucial for the democratic society, for the democratic functioning of societies. And I have to say that in particular, a number of European commissioners and Vice President Timmermans does that all the time uh, already. Um, the second point is um, to provide resources. Um, the EU can provide resources in certain areas, again, in the area of EU, law, uh, EU competence. Um, resources, I would like to mention two things. The one thing is financial resources, but the other thing is capacity. Um, the financial resources, I will not go into detail because there will be a whole panel on this, but just to say there is this new, newly developed Justice, Rights and Values Fund, which is exactly there to provide funding for the defense of democratic values in very short, <laughs> short terms. Yeah. But there is also a new instrument that is not so well known, uh, that is that the DG Justice is working on a tool to support strategic litigation. Um, also, the EU already gives, since many years, funding for EU umbrella NGOs, 
umbrella organization, including the infrastructure funding, which we are criticizing is not often given at national level, but the EU gives that funding at the, at the EU level to quite a number of important umbrella organizations. Um, I will leave it at that for the finance, for the uh, providing resources, yeah, and what it should do, sorry, what the EU should do, uh, probably, of course, I mean, you mentioned the discussion on the multi-annual financial framework. Of course, from the perspective of civil society, it's always desirable, of course, that the funding for these instruments is uh, sufficient and is hopefully increased. Yeah? But so in the funding, there's currently negotiations going on about the next financial framework, so the next funding period for the EU budget. And there, it's still under discussion and um, several funding instruments are uh, are given a certain amount of, of funding. Also, maybe important for civic so space and never mentioned is the structural funds uh, of the EU where uh, it would be important to have conditionalities introduced for fundamental rights in a more rigorous way than it's uh, currently done. On building capacity, just very briefly, that's partly financing the capacity building, but that's partly also giving the capacity building. I'm notably thinking about the area of how can civil society use the EU law to defend civil society space. Uh, but there are other areas as well, like cooperation, engagement methods, etc. That brings me directly to the point on EU law. Uh, from my humble perspective, I think EU law for the protection of civic space is still very underused. There is a lot more that civil society organizations could do with the existing EU law. Um, I give you just some keywords. Um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights has provisions uh, for the defense of civic space. There are the four fundamental freedoms of the EU and for the civic space in particular of importance is the freedom of uh, movement of the freedom of capital where donors are trying to use that to fight the foreign funding rules in some countries under the freedom of, of capital. But also I know that some uh, organizations have looked into using the freedom of services for the service provision, from the service provision angle also. But I think it still needs to be further explored. We had a, a big event uh, some weeks ago, the Fundamental Rights Forum, where we had, it was under the overall topic of belonging and fundamental rights for all, but we had six sessions on civil society space, and one of the sessions was dedicated to how can the EU law be better used to defend civic space. Um, and some of the outcomes is that uh, really, it's important that civil society builds its own capacity to use, uh, really, hardcore legal capacity on how to use EU law uh, for this. Um, then, of course, under EU law, there are the infringement procedures by the European Commission, which are, of course, ongoing since a long time. Most well known are probably the infringement procedures against uh, Hungary in the area of the foreign funding, for example, uh, but also the Stop Soros legislation. So this is ongoing, and the EU, we are observing, of course, the EU Commission on this, and I have to say they really become active every time there is a legal possibility with the infringement procedures. Um, then there is... Yeah, if you, if you can plan to be very short, because our time is really, really... Okay, the need for better guidance on the implementation of certain, such as the anti-money laundering directive, uh, and the rule of law framework, uh, which triggers, yeah, which is the... the um, strongest tool the EU has. Um, point four, provide protection. That's a bit more contested under the mandate of the EU. What I mean with this is making issues public provides protection already. Going to visits uh, to countries, giving visibility. The EU is very, very good at this in an EU external context. There are guidelines on human rights defenders. There is guidance for the EU delegations on how to support civil society externally. One of the points we are recommending is that the EU should also look at how to implement this exactly same model EU internally. Um, addressing policymakers, that's going on. Uh, our own platform, the Fundamental Rights Platform, was in the past, uh, uh, is a platform for exchange of information and pooling of knowledge. We are currently discussing with our organizations and with the advisory panel how to develop that further also into an area of protection. Um, yeah, and the use of EU law I have mentioned. The last point is the EU can use its, uh, what we call the convening power and the connecting power to, um, to build trust uh, and to enable conversations that might otherwise not happen. Uh, the EU has the tool of the social dialogue. 
under the Treaty of the European Union. Um, the Fundamental Rights Agency, where I can say it concretely, what we are trying to do is to bring together different types of organ civil society organizations, for example, that don't agree at all into a, a, a safe space for conversations, but we are also trying to, what we call, break the silos, bringing together policymakers and civil society, uh, and in this context then uh, sometimes conversations can happen uh, for the first time. I wanted to say one last sentence is because you said, someone uh, discussed and said before, uh, where should we look, look for agency, what can, where, <coughs> where is the positive? Uh, our observation is that a lot of positive things are happening. We have in our report a lot of positive, good examples. The problem with these is that they are created in one place and they stay in that one place. So I think there is a role also for the EU to, uh, to work more, as well as for civil society itself, to make this known, to exchange the learnings, to replicate what we have already learned in one place, to, uh, to replicate it in another place. Very last sentence on this, I have observed this civil society space topic and the EU for three years now. I have to say, I think the EU itself has come a very long way in understanding the challenges, in understanding the urgency, and in, in, in starting to be active about it. Uh, thank you. I had a number of comments coming uh, <laughs> uh, as long as you were uh, saying uh, your recommendations, but I think I, uh, we won't have time to get uh, back to it. I would uh, put the, the high responsibility on you, Vedran, to say a few uh, last words, which we will use also as conclusions, because we won't have time to conclude. I guess, uh, last insights comment. Uh, I mean, the, the, the first conclusion is, is, is basically very easy. The time is faster than we are. Uh, that goes uh, for the panel discussions, obviously, as we are, uh, we are like 10 minutes uh, running behind the time. Uh, but this is also, on a serious side, uh, something that we have to, to say for the future of the European Union. Uh, the high pro the probability is that we are going to face a more when a different European Union after May 2019. And I believe the, the fight for the future of Europe will then, in the next period of the next few years, start only after the elections in May 2019. This is a pretext. Uh, and, and, and what I mean here is basically when you, when you start and when the citizens start uh, seeing what kind of animal is developing, and we will see this kind of animal in the European Parliament, then uh, you have to decide uh, which avenue to take. And this is my first point. I mean, neither Europe nor uh, democracy nor liberal values are a supermarket. Uh, this has to be pretty much uh, clearly said. It's not a supermarket where you go like the, 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 these chameleons do. You go preach a bit of democracy, you buy a bit of bread, but then you skip. Uh, uh, it's, it's not just picking what you want to pick. It's a whole package. It's a package with values, with underlying uh, a notion of so solidarity, etc., etc. It, it, it has to be basically said and, and outspokenly said. But, I mean, uh, and, and, and the answer lies basically in the multitude of answers and of all answers that we can provide as individuals. This is basically this kind of a multitude, and we are doing it on a daily basis. We have been doing it on a daily basis. What you said, what you said, what you are doing, Alexandrina, and all of us, uh, this is basically one of the answers for the future of Europe. But just to be more precise, I believe the first point is we have to reclaim and fight for the terms. Democracy has been hijacked, liberalism has been hijacked, uh, a civil society as a term has been hijacked. When you today ask the, the Serbian population what they think about the civil society, they will tell you bastards, 80%, Soros, whatever. So fight and reclaim uh, the terms, which means fight for the public and reclaim the public. And this goes back to this very Habermasian uh, kind of uh, deliberative moment that we have to, 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 to recreate in a way. The second one is address the social issue, and this is very fundamental. It's about a livable life and it's about a decent life. If you have the Austrian government trying to cut uh, the Mindestsicherung, whatever the Mindestsicherung in Germany is, and then uh, today came the ruling basically that the Mindestsicherung in, for the asylum seekers in Oberösterreich, in Upper Austria, is not according to the European law. Uh, you have to tell citizens that basically when you start distinguishing and drawing lines between 
uh, within the society, between asylum seekers, refugees, then the next step will be between, between you living in the second district, you living in the third, you uh, wearing a hat, you not wearing a hat, etc., etc. This is the line uh, that is going to destroy European democracies. That has to be said. And this decent life is a, is a fundamental question. If there is no decent life for the asylum seeker, there is no decent life for me, for whomever I am. The third uh, point is basically uh, this kind of a value-based approach to issues that has to be, and someone said it, someone was sitting here speaking about values. I mean, this kind of an underlying moment, uh, uh, and which has to refer to some kind of a good or common sense that is still among us. I mean, it's not, everything is, is not dark uh, as, as sometimes is, it's, it's portrayed. So, and, and the conclusion would be, and this is what I deeply believe, so societies, whatever society you take, they need visions. They need some utopian horizons. The, never ever in the history of humankind there was a society that was able to survive without visions. What do we have today? We have retrotopian uh, visions of society. This is what Zygmunt Bauman told us in his last very wise book. People offering the solutions for today's problems, uh, looking back to the state of nation state, homogeneous ethnic, ethnic nation state, whatever you take. Or you have the dystopian, uh, uh, visions like do, uh, in, in Philippines or wherever where you just smash uh, and destroy the, the very tissue of the society. And this kind of a utopian moment that, that sounds always, I mean Zizek is playing with that and you have this small booklet by Rutke Bregman, Utopia for Realists, etc, etc. But there is something true that these visions and utopian horizons are the lifeblood of democracies. Uh, and, and, and in a way to, to how to work on it how to create this kind of joy and optimism that you need for a democratic society. And I believe that democratic societies are joyful societies, optimist societies, uh, contrary to the authoritarian states where you fear, where you are told to behave, to, uh, to, to be obedient in a way. Uh, and, 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 and basically, that, how to fill this utopia, create this utopia full of joy, optimism, but at the same time not being naive, I mean, it's not about you know, we are happy, shiny, and we, we hug each other. It's, it's about being realistic, but at the same time, still joyful. I mean, quadrature des I don't know what quadrature des in, in, in English is, but uh, the uh, square of the, of, the, of, the, of the circle, square of the circle will be easy. Uh, uh, and and, and that, that has to be a, a, a kind of a, of a momentum that we have to work uh, uh, towards and this uh, uh, kind of an exercise has to be and, and I really like and all, I'm always quoting Caroline Emke, the German uh, publicist, uh, with her like conclusion in this book against the hate, published 2017 or 16, uh, and then she speaks about how to create a new V and what is a V. Uh, and there is a new book by this Tristan Garcia in French about how to create a V or whatever, uh, and then she says this new V has to be constructive, uh, it has to be courageous, and it has to be tender. Courageous, constructive, and tender. And this, I, I, I do believe that that can be a line for recreating this kind of, uh, of, 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 of a vision of a different society, as again, societies and democratic societies need a vision. So. Thank you. Uh, I need that courageous we are. <laughs> We have a little bit of problem with being constructive, uh, but I think that uh, currently inside civil society there's a huge reflection on how do we cope with the new brave new worlds, and uh, I'm sure that there are strong engines inside, inside civil society, and I'm sure that every one of us here in the room is convinced about our capacities to bring solidarity some steps forward. Uh, otherwise, uh, they will bring our societies backwards, uh, to the point where uh, it took centuries to emancipate from. Um, thank you very much for uh, what I found as a fascinating debate. I think we could go on for hours and for hours, but I think we should leave space for, uh, for the second panel to happen. If I'm not wrong, I think we uh, have a coffee break, 20 minutes coffee break, uh, and then uh, Franz will introduce the next panel. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.